Well, it's always good to see a room at capacity, <laughs> even if it is on a remote farm on Douglas Head. Um, but the reason it's at capacity is because you're all here to um, hear Graham's talk. Um, I was aware of Graham about 10 years ago. He used to pop into the bookshop where I work to buy interesting books, and he looked interesting. I thought, you know, I wonder what, wonder what he's up to. Um, and um, I know a little bit about his life story. I'm, I'm sure he might share that some, uh, some of that with you, but it's absolutely fascinating. And part of this event is to share people's <coughs> stories and practices and, and, and wisdom and insights from various angles. Um, and Graham's is one of them, okay? Uh, and the stuff he's doing in the community is, is really important. And obviously, he's going to talk about that as well. So I'll be quiet now. I just want you to uh, big hand of applause for Graham Klukas. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Mike, uh, and thank you to the Children's Centre for allowing to, us to use this awesome venue. Uh, and thank you all for coming uh, to listen to me. So what I'm going to talk about today is my story. Uh, it's a journey. Uh, it's in many ways now a pilgrimage. Uh, and on many levels, it's really, really quite spiritual. Uh, the term non-duality is this new buzzword. Uh, I like to use the word connectedness, really. Uh, and that's part of what I do now uh, as a guy who set up Quing. Uh, it's about connecting people who have become isolated from the main part of uh, the community. So my life is broken into two halves. The first half uh, from being in childhood up to the age of 33 was could be described as a, a journey into madness, uh, insanity, but nobody ever ends up insane or mad or sectioned like I did. Uh, it's a journey. It's the damage, it's the trauma. So I'll start as a kid. Uh, my early earliest memories of is of not belonging, of being disconnected being alone and not good enough. And that journey of, you know, from a childhood feeling like that was so deeply traumatic and damaging that you learned ways of coping with it. You know, so I, was, I learned quite early on to isolate myself from people. Uh, I'm still not a very social person. Uh, Eight, by the time I was eight or nine, I was drinking regularly. Uh, my step-grandmother fed, fed me eggnog laced with brandy to keep me quiet. Uh, and this numbing with substances was just the beginning. Uh, school was hell, undiagnosed dyslexia, undiagnosed dyspraxia, autism, trait, autism traits. Got to 12, 13, found vodka, found oblivion, and that became my life. Every weekend from 13, 14, getting pissed. So I didn't remember. When I was 15, 16, I dis discovered drugs. Uh, so back in the 80s, it was cannabis, it was speed, it was acid. And I just, weekends, starting on Friday to Sunday, just getting off my head out of my head, because if I wasn't in my head, uh, I was at peace. So, 16, 17, 18, started dealing when I was 18, uh, because I thought having money <laughs> would make me popular, having drugs would make me popular. And so began this pattern of seeking meaning through being popular. I was the only reason I was popular was because I had money and I had drugs. But you don't see it like that when you're there. It's, uh, it just becomes normal. Then as I reached the end of my teens and got into, into my twenties, I started to fail at everything. Uh, new job every six months, uh, absolutely no stability. Uh, And I decided, my life descended into chaos. Uh, and it was just the, 
beginning of madness. And then as life progressed, uh, I started looking for a way of healing. Uh, and in that, I went to a Tai Chi class. And about 45 minutes into the Tai Chi class, I met the light for a better term. And meeting that light and seeing my own darkness sent me over the edge. And about three weeks later, I left my girlfriend's house, uh, walked down to the ragged and set fire to myself. Uh, tried to make it look like an accident or it was meant to look like a murder that someone had murdered me. Uh, I garroted myself, stabbed myself a half a dozen times and then poured a load of lighter fluid over myself and set fire to myself. Luckily, I don't remember doing it, I jumped into the river Neb and floated from the top end of the ragged down to the ragged br bridge. Uh, uh, I nearly died of hypothermia. Uh, and the reason I'm not scarred is I spent six hours in the River Neb uh, in November. I then ended up in the old Bellamona, uh, put on antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, uh, injections, and all it was was managing me. It wasn't about healing me. And four years, or just close to four years, I spent sectioned in Bellamona. Uh, being insane is a good place. I know that may sound a really strange thing to say, but you have absolutely no responsibility. It's all taken off you. And it becomes, it becomes as addictive as the drugs you're taking because if you have no responsibility, you can do whatever you like. Uh, care in the community came in. Uh, so they started closing the long term words and I went through the, the rehab part two or three times into the community, back into the secure unit. So there was this yo-yoing yo yo from community back. Uh, and then in the end, I made the decision I had had enough. Uh, I saved up enough tablets to kill two horses. I also had got some vodka and I walked away from society up into the hills, took all the tablets and drank the vodka. And I thought that was me. That was, I'd had enough. Uh, in those four years, I don't remember how many times I tried to kill myself, but that was the one I wanted to work. I woke up four days later in the gutter of a road, rushed into hospital, uh, and the cycle began. But they took me off Prozac. I'd been on Prozac for four years. I was out of hospital, back living a normal life, unsectioned within about six weeks. I then went back to dealing, got into heroin, and my life just started to spiral out of control. Uh, that would have been 97. I then recognized how chaotic my life was and I went off to Ireland to become a deep sea fisherman. Unfortunately, wherever you go, you bring yourself with you. Uh, and within a few months I was back dealing, I was back enforcing for a drug gang, I was back causing mayhem wherever I went, uh, and it was just chaos. Everybody I knew was into this life, uh, new boat every six months, broken relationships, and more medication, and it was in October 99, I was arrested for disposing of, I was actually arrested for murder, but they then dropped the charge down to disposing of a body. Uh, it was just the life, you know, it was normal. So I ended up in prison in Ireland. I was in a prison of 500 
and I was the only one with an English accent, so you can just imagine how that was for me. Uh, eventually they dropped the charge so I could get bailed back to the Isle of Man, went straight back to that life, because it was just the only thing I knew. Society wouldn't accept me. Uh, and all the services that were meant to help me only wanted to manage my behaviours, they didn't want me to heal. Uh, so I was on bail for just over two years. I was on the front of the newspaper every six weeks for two years. And it was just like hell, you know, it was just this madness, you know, ecstasy, heroin, coke, cannabis, and some other drugs that most people haven't heard of, plus 15 different medications a day. <coughs> And I just just spiral down. Uh, then I went back to prison for eighteen months. So that was two thousand and two to two thousand and three. I remember. Mm. Mm. And this, when I was in prison in Ireland, there was just keep keep my head down. I remember the way I got through prison was every morning I used to get up two hours before everybody else and I would sit in silence and that kept me sane. I got out of prison in 2003 and I came back to the other man uh, and again I just started again just went back to dealing hitting people and the anger and the violence just progressively got worse. Uh, then I went off to Holland and through a friend got a job with a pretty nasty group of people in Holland and when I was in Holland I could see the writing on the wall and I wanted to get out uh, so I came back to the UK I stayed with one of my friends for six months and did like a detox for a better term I rattled off everything uh, and I thought I'd settle in the in the UK uh, but I came back and it started again. Uh, so again, got involved with mental health, got involved with the DAT team, got involved with Dash as it was then. And I just felt it was like nothing, nothing. It was just like manage. I was getting slowly worse, whatever tablets they put into me. And then in 2005, uh, I made a really, really, really hard decision and that was to walk away from the services that were meant to be helping me. Uh, so it was just like I'd had enough of the services. Uh, so I asked my key worker if he knew a spiritual way out off where I was at. I didn't fit any of the categorizations I'd been labeled with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, psychotic, and they were just trying to manage the, an ever increasing uh, symptoms. So I walked away and I went and joined the Baptist church where it sounded the strangest thing I, I could have done. But looking backwards, in many ways it was going to the beach mission in Port St. Mary when I was a little kid. That was the first place I went to search. So I stayed at the Baptist church for about a year and a half. And in that period, uh, I learned that I could have some control of my thoughts. And then the happy clappy bit, it, new emotions started to come up. So there was this healing, this re-engagement, uh, and it was quite a wonderful experience. But at the same time, I learned mindfulness uh, some, one of my friends said, you need to learn meditation. So he brought me up to a, he brought me up to a polytunnel in Derby and Mill taught me how to meditate. Uh, and that was the beginning of my contemplative phase. I then went to the Anglican church for a while, uh, which was like that deepening of the contemplative part of what I needed. And I got into centering prayer, got into 
Christian mysticism in a huge way. Uh, and then this journey just developed. Uh, so I helped set up Grai, or what I helped set up what's now called Grai, which is a homeless hostel in Douglas. So I worked with homeless people for a year and a half. I got involved and I was searching for something and I didn't know what it was. Uh, then I was lucky enough, a course in the UK found me. Uh, so I went and studied at a Roman Catholic seminary for a year, doing a counselling and alternate therapy course, which is the easiest way to describe it. So there was 55 of us on the course. I was the only one who wasn't a nun, a monk or a father. I was the only one who was, had an English accent again. Uh, and there was 23 nations on the course. Uh, and I learned what it was to be human. I remember about three quarters of the way through the course, I looked, woke up and thought to myself, I'm no longer an ex-addict, I'm a human being. And that was a moment of... That was one of those moments I will always remember. So I came out of that in 2008. And after being around monks and sisters and nuns, uh, I decided I was going to go and test my vocation to become an enclosed monk. Uh, so I found the most austere Anglican monastery in the world and went and lived as a hermit for a year. Uh, and in that process, I stopped being just up here and started to live from there down. Uh, I still go regularly. It's my, it's my guilty pleasure in many ways that when I've had enough of the world, I just go. Uh, and it's just somewhere I can just go and be. And I feel it's one of the few places in this life I feel like I belong. Uh, and it's most probably one of the most strangest environments you can ever imagine just being. Uh, and in that period of a year, I learned more about spirituality and who I am and my connectedness to stuff than I ever thought possible. Uh, and that <laughs> then led on, so I came back. So I was offered uh, a university place and funding to go to university when I was at the monastery. And that was the reason I didn't stay. Uh, so I went off to uni in 2011. Uh, so it turns out I'm really, really badly dyslexic and had the writing and reading ability of an eight year old when I was 35. So when I was 40, I went to uni and started a master's degree uh, without any qualifications, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, so doing the master's degree, I trained as a counselor uh, I've got a master's in counselling. I also have some postgraduate qualifications in psychotherapy. And I met Gabby uh, on the way to uni. So that's why I'm not a monk. Uh, and it was just this journey of putting one foot in front of the other. Next challenge, next bit of growth. Because, you know, for me, I will learn about who I am my trauma and how to heal. It's a journey that just continues. So I thought after uni that I'd settle down and these things would, you know, I would get a job. But for whatever reason, that wasn't my path. Uh, and I kept searching. I was looking for something still. And I was working in London. I was working at a therapeutic community. I was doing social, uh, working social enterprises. <laughs> I was working with guys who'd been in prison for 35 years on a single sentence, so some pretty hideous crimes, but something was missing. Uh, and then in Easter 2015, I was looking for something in my bedside cabinet and I found a stone from Flesic Beach, which was my safe place as I was growing up. And I asked little Graham, because I've been doing some inner child work, what would he like to do with the stone? And as soon as I said it, it was, he would like to throw it off the end of the world. So Big Graham says, where's the end of the world? And then a series of events happened over the next six weeks. So I found the end of the world. 
some money arrived from nowhere uh, and Gabby said you can go uh, and on Tinwell Day 2015 I set off for a 2,000 mile walk across Europe to the end of the world uh, so I followed ancient pilgrimage paths so I did uh, the Canterbury to Rome then I did the Vesalay to Santiago and then a week to the coast to a place called Cape Finisterre so if anybody has any Latin that means Cape at the finish of earth so that's the end of the world uh, and I got there and threw the stone off uh, came back to where I was living just outside London and I then six months later came back to the Isle of Man which is the center of my world which I learned and I still couldn't find what I was looking for. It was just one of those. What am I really looking for? What am I, what am I looking for? And I was getting depressed again. I was getting really anxious and it was like, what am I looking for? And then in 20, May 2016, I made the decision that I was going to turn the Isle of Man into a giant pilgrimage. And I got, you know, the really big maps. So I got like four of them and drew, I got them on the wall. And I drew a, a labyrinth of, on the Isle of Man. So you go round and then you go, so, uh, so every hill, every valley, I walked up. And I spent 10 days walking around the Isle of Man. Uh, and I found what I was looking for, it was somewhere to belong. And then from then, uh, Quinn has just like materialized, which has been quite an exceptional uh, journey, if you want to call it that. Uh, and it's just happened. It's not, it's not, so, you know, it's just <coughs> evolving and it's organic. Uh, and it's been like just awesome watching it grow. Uh, so Queen, in many ways, is a reflection of my own journey. But in other ways, it's bringing up, you know, people who are far better far better skilled and have more experience than me to, and it's like a hybridization of things so we're doing peer and mentor training we have some really good trauma therapists uh, and we do like community development out in the world uh, so the way I try and describe it is by making community bigger it can hold more but then there needs to be a pathway for people who have been isolated or pushed away from society back in so Quings that that pathway back for people. Uh, so that's my story. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. <laughs>